History happened everywhere. The verdict. This is our after show podcast where we look back at the most recent episode, Easy Come, Easy Go, in Australia during the Atomic Age. That's 1945 to now. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and check it out. Otherwise, you may encounter spoilers ahead. Oh, sorry, you caught me taking a sip. Hello and welcome to History Happened Everywhere, The Verdict. I'm your host, Peter Goddard. I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Ryan Weir. Hello! And of course, as ever, the deeply devout, the dutiful, the delightful, Mr. Paul Dursley. I don't think I'm devout. (laughs) (laughs) Yet we praise you. Yeah, maybe we're the devout ones. Who knows? So, how are you doing, Mr. Dursley? Um, I am not too bad. Not too bad. Good. And Mr. Weir? I'm keeping my chin up. Is keeping your chin up better than keeping your pecker up? <laughs> Depends on what's happening to you at that present moment. If you're drowning, <laughs> I'd say keep your chin up first. <laughs> in other circumstances, pecker before chin. <laughs> That's a t-shirt in the making. Pecker before chin. <laughs> It occurred to me that we could go one step further and do the thing that Google isn't doing. Do you want to answer the questions that nobody's asking? Kind of. (laughs) So there are a bunch of questions, right? Rhetorical questions that don't have any answers. But if Paul could answer them, we could be the first ones to answer the rhetorical questions. Okay. Right? Okay. So I assume you have a list. I do have a list. (laughs) You might have a list. (laughs) God, and one of those again. (laughs) So question number one. What's the matter with kids today? What is the matter with kids today? They don't know they were born. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, they're all stupid. Who's counting? In what base? I would have gone with The Count from Sesame Street. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know that reference. (laughs) (laughs) All right, next question. Enough of this. Do you you know I'm I'm fed up of all of your asking stupid, pointless questions? All right, well, I've got some questions. No, shut up. So I have written some questions for you. Oh, Ooh. okay. Oh, how the turntables. So put your thinking caps on, gentlemen. Okay. I'm ready. What do we win if we get all of these right? What you don't win is my opprobrium. Don't want you probing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, which scientist in 1905 had his anis mirabilis? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start strong. Okay. With doctor. Oh, right. That's a good strong yeah, that's start, good, right? Strong. Some, I like it. Professor. No, that's, that's as far as I got. Uh, that was it. You just got strong yeah. with doctor and then run out of words. <laughs> then man or woman's name. <laughs> yeah. Followed by surname. John Wimbleforce. <laughs> Is it Dr. John Wimbleforce? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, so that is enough of that. I think we've demonstrated that Ryan and I are highly skilled and any good quiz team would be delighted to have us aboard. Mm-hmm. So uh, we are here to talk about the episode, if this is to remind you, Australia in the Atomic Age, in Easy Come, Easy Go topic. Uh, Ryan, have you prepared a one-minute summary to remind the listeners what we talked about? Uh, yes, I have. So your one minute starts now. In this Aussie-based episode of History Happened Everywhere, we went down under to examine whether things in the Atomic Age were easy come, easy go. We started looking at the history of the Aussies from the indigenous peoples through the early European settlers to modern-day Bruce and Sheila's. We discovered that the Atomic Age was coined by a journalist who witnessed the first nuclear detonation, learned that the Atomic Age is still with us, and, for good or bad, will likely continue for some time to come. We tried a delicious traditional Aussie birthday treat called fairy bread and washed that down with a slab of Vic Stubbies. And while enjoying our beers, I told three different stories. One about David Glasheen, the millionaire castaway who lost his fortune and set up home as the Robinson Crusoe of Restoration Island, where he still lives today, 25 years later. Then we heard about Campbell Simpson, the could-have-been multi-millionaire who lost a hard drive containing a thousand Bitcoin and watched as the price of the coins kept on rising. Finally, we covered the rise and fall of the Easy Beats, Australia's answers to the Beatles, and the mysterious vanishing of their documentary. All in all, we discovered that everyone involved had a fair dink attitude towards their losses and that Australia needs to make the Neighbours TV show theme tune their national anthem as soon as possible. That was last week's episode done. Summarised nicely. Nice one, son. Now we're over to a young Dursley who's going to tell you what he thought of me. He'll take you apart without any care. He's the lovely Paul Dursley. The lovely Paul Dursley. 
Well, I absolutely agree with that last part. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, Ryan, so if we can turn to you, Mr. Dursley, just to get your first feelings about the episode. Did you think that was a winner or a frustrating loser of a show? Well, Australians don't like losing, do they? But they've lost quite a lot recently. Yeah, that's a good point. That sort of nationally suggests easy come, easy go doesn't really apply to their sporting prowess because they take that stuff really seriously. But yeah, I think that's an antidote, Ryan, to the claim that the Australians are by nature an easy come, easy go, relaxed, lay back people because they're sporting wise are very successful and that would belie that theory that's that's really interesting actually because like i did some research on this and uh, you know whether or not it is a stereotype or whether it is just a trait of the australian people to be laid back sort of more relaxed than perhaps other cultures whilst that stereotype definitely exists their use of slang and like economized language those sort of things that that seems to be more a thing of the past a window into a culture that perhaps used to exist and perhaps less so or becoming becoming less and less so I believe it's called larrikin culture. Oh, is that right? What does larrikin mean? I think larrikin is like a, a name for a pretty uncouth man. Interesting. Never heard of that. You might you might want to ask ask her to look it up in her lovely Australian accent. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Good day. This is the Sheila of the internet. Larrikin is a term meaning a mischievous young person, an uncultivated lout or hoodlum who is rowdy but is ultimately a good-hearted person. Larrikin likely originates from the Scottish Gaelic word lubiche, which means scoundrel. Larrikinism arose as a reaction to the authority imposed upon early convicts. The term was used to describe members of street gangs who were noted for their antisocial behaviour. Larrikinism is mainly associated with males, however females were also present in larrikin gangs. The women were rejected by the rest of society, lived together and called themselves mates. These girls often engaged in violent behaviour, smashing windows singing songs with obscene lyrics and holding no desire to behave responsibly. Good on ya. So an example of easy go uh, attitude. 1977, the ex-Australian cricketer Dennis Lilly, he greeted the Queen with, G'day, how you going? <laughs> Which is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Which apparently breaks a whole bunch of like... Uh, with protocol. The protocol, yes. I have to say I'm with the Australians on this matter. If you can't just say, hey, how you doing to the Queen then there's too many rules in that situation. Because that's a fair question. Didn't one of their politicians once touch the Queen? (gasps) Was that a hick of outrage, or are you (laughs) been on the sauce again? (laughs) (laughs) The shock. It was such a shock. Man handled the Queen. (laughs) I mean, he didn't throw her over his shoulder, presumably, and run off. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, anyway, so I spoke to some Aussies to sort of just ask their opinion. Do they think that they're laid back? You know, what's the the feeling on the ground? Um, And so it seems like since the 80s and 90s, there's sort of been a shift away from that sort of laid back attitude. Australia, it seems, has become more divided, much like, you know, the rest of the world is a a strong right wing politics becoming more prevalent. It seems that Australians are becoming more aspirational, like they're desiring bigger houses. They want the two cars, kids in private school, overseas holidays, you know, those sort of things, material wealth. And those that don't have wealth are therefore looked down upon. And debt has grown. People are borrowing more to try and maintain that lavish lifestyle and debt levels are rising in fact 42 percent of all mortgages are now interest only wow huge amount yeah interest rates are super low million dollar mortgages are now being normalized so people are just borrowing and borrowing and borrowing i spoke with this uh, one guy on reddit a guy called you merciful barbarian he wrote uh, i have less of a she'll be right mentality and more of a everybody's gonna die come watch tv mentality as a begr- <laughs> Judging Gen Z, I hear that statement a lot from people of a similar age to me. Anyway, it, it does seem to be something that is being demonstrated and you can see visually through the news at the moment at, at time of recording. You know, there's a lot of anti-vaccination protests that are happening in Melbourne. The police are out and it does seem to be seems highly tense atmosphere more than anything else. I, d- I don't know. Australians have always been bullshit. They always turned their noses up at authority. You know, they... Their troops mutinied a couple of times in the First World War. I can understand that. You've gone from Australia, you're having a nice time. (laughs) By the beach. You patch yourself on the front line of World War I for a country that doesn't really respect you, which is understandable, frankly. 
So I think Australia's most famous exports, the sort of actresses and actors and sports people, tend to at least convey that sort of, I think it might be in the, the, the form of words they use, the language they use, the Russell Crowe's of the world, have that sort of down to earth. He's a New Zealander. Them. Is he? Yes. What do you know about pop culture anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking it up. Born in New Zealand. But is he a New Zealander? The 57-year-old Oscar-winning actor revealed he's not actually an Australian citizen. despite wow. Despite having spent most of his life there. How the hell did you know that, Dursley? Where'd you get that little pop culture nugget from? Well, it's not a pop culture nugget. I like hypocritical facts about hypocrites. <laughs> I mean, he he immigrated to Australia when he was four years old. By all measures, he ought to be considered Australian if he's lived his entire life there. Yeah, I would say anyone who's lived somewhere since they were four probably qualifies as being acceptable. Yet, I am still correct. You are still you are, correct. Yeah. Well, yeah. yes. I mean, inevitably, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But a lot of Australians aren't actually Australian. Because uh, if you remember, a few years ago, a lot of politicians had to actually resign because they weren't actually Australian. They were either New Zealanders or British because they hadn't taken Australian citizenship. Wow. Because then, you know, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, effectively the same citizenship. You know, they had the same head of state and it was, to all intents and purposes, one country, three systems. And it is a bit of, ultimately, a bit of paperwork, right? If you've lived somewhere since you were four yeah. and you, you identify with that place... What the certificate says is kind of moot, isn't it? Yeah, but, you, you know, there's on the Australian Constitution, you know, as repatriated, what, in 1986, I think, um, was, you know, they, you have to be an Australian citizen. Technically, you need to be listed as Australian on your, or have an Australian passport. I get it. It does, it is an interesting concept as to sort of who you are, identity and nationality, that you can fully identify with a nation that you are actually, when it comes to the letter of the law, yeah. not a, a member of you i might point to australia's favorite 60s rock band the easy beats i've heard of them as an example <laughs> of that were australian only because they immigrated there again you know when they were in their what late teens oh so they weren't australian as well they weren't born there no they were of oh, okay. uh, dutch scottish and british origin oh, okay it's the same for this country. You sort of go to America, supposedly, to make your name. And lots of Australians always used to come to Britain to initially make their name. And then if they made that name, then they went to America. I, th I think mainly now they're going straight to America over the Pacific. Yeah. It really gives you a sense of how vanishingly difficult and vanishingly rare true success is. Because I would consider, amongst every musician that I've ever known, getting signed itself is the, the moment of success. Sure. And then these guys got signed and they a world tour and you think well that is already in the top whatever half percent one percent of people who want to be bands yeah and then suddenly it's still gone sufficiently horribly wrong there's there's no security there at all it was that was really came home to me i just thought well you signed you get some tour that's i assumed underwritten by the record company but that they were plunging themselves into debt really shocked me yeah no and, and i think that's common throughout the 20th century and probably still the case now i'm not sure how it works with uh, the streaming services you know modern streaming services like spotify and apple and such whether or not those contracts are the same or whether or not you know, if you sign with spotify is that slightly different um do you still have to pay for things but it's probably less stuff you have to pay for because you're not actually creating physical media anymore but certainly i believe in the old days you'd have to buy out your cds or you'd pay towards the artwork for it so i have a theory that that you could very easily make a successful easy beats movie mm -hmm. with the soundtrack from the best of the easy beats and suddenly all of this you've got a whole back catalogue waiting to be utilized yeah you're gonna make a fortune ryan well i would write it only in 2017 somebody wrote a two-part tv movie for abc called friday on my mind which was the so easy is the, is story. It, so sorry ryan is this another reading episode where you just read something and you're just spouting it out again i didn't read the movie no did you just watch the movie <laughs> Did you watch it? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. I'm trying to get hold of a copy. Obviously, it's Australian TV, so it's a bit tricky for me to find here in the UK. But I have my sources through Easy Beat fan forums. Who's going to try and find it for me? But yeah, it's, it's. I've seen trailers on YouTube and such, and it shows the the guys getting together, and it's kind of cool. It looks it looks good. One thing that I did read about it is that uh, there is a sequence in Friday on My Mind which they recreate, which is based on truth, which is about George Young, member of the band, uh, in 19. 
1965, there was a fan magazine which published Young's Home Address. <laughs> right? And a crowd of 300 girls descended on his house and around 20 managed to get their way inside the house and then they just trampled like his his brothers out of the way they pillaged the house and took a whole bunch of souvenirs and then the police turned up and had to kick them all out apparently that's in that's in the movie did they all leave their knickers behind well that you can imagine i'm sure 300 of them there that they, they probably would have done talking of the fan forum though for the easy beats i i spoke with uh, a couple of guys uh, there's one guy called graham lou Merritt. he wrote and he said i work at buckley and nunn in Burke Street, Melbourne, in the 60s. There was a club called Ten Avenue, uh, which was open at lunch times. The Easy Beats played there. Whoa, 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 sorry. There was a club that was open at lunch times. That's very easy come, easy go. It's the 60s. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. And the Easy Beats played there all the time. He said, I went there so often that they asked if I could hold the girls back from getting on the stage when they were playing. We had the best times, he said. They were with Billy Thorpe, the best band at the time. I still play their records most days. Robert Bradshaw said, saved Stevie from being crushed by fans in Adelaide at the old Hilton Motel. My mother fed him when he was in Adelaide. He recognised me in the crowd at the Octagon in Elizabeth and called out, see you at the party. Got instant fame. Nice. Nice little memories of these guys. Oh, so what a great job. Oh, sorry. Can you hold the girls back? (laughs) Yeah. It's a very niche role, but someone's got to do it. (laughs) Can't hold easy fever back. True, but I'm willing to give it a go. (laughs) What's easy fever? Not Beatlemania, but for the easy beats. Oh, okay. I did listen to the podcast, you know. I know, but we understand that pop culture doesn't affix itself into your brain in the same way as maths and physics does. (laughs) Next section. (laughs) David Glasheen. Let's talk about David Glasheen. So, Paul, what I want to know is, David Glasheen lived on a desert island for many, many years. To what degree did you identify with David Glasheen's new and exciting lifestyle as one man on his own on a deserted island? It's a good question. If you'd have lost all your cash 25 years ago, do you think you would have ever moved to a desert island? No. Because you crave the company of others? I don't crave the company of others, but... I think I need the company of others at a distance. <laughs> <laughs> so what you need is a desert island, that maybe just like on a roundabout. So mm. there's a road, a moat of some kind. So there's a little bit of something protecting you. Well, that's sort of that's sort of what he had, wasn't it? It was only a couple of hundred yards off the it, shore. It was only a couple hundred meters. Yeah, you can literally see the mainland. Ah. <laughs> just wave at people. In fairness, I don't see you, Paul, foraging for your own uh, oysters and such. Oh no, <laughs> I don't like oysters. But you could brew your own beer. Yes. I'd take a long while, though. Well, you've got plenty of time, though. You're living on a desert island. And you might get Russell Crowe come join you for dinner. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, I was wondering about that. So, uh, so if you're Russell Crowe in this example, do do we assume that Russell Crowe had read the David Lachine story and went, I want to meet this guy? No, he was passing by and just saw someone on the island, I guess. So it was li- it was literally just hello. He, he was I'm island just... hopping. It was his honeymoon. So he was on his yacht uh, with his new wife, and yeah, they were just cruising oh, around. Oh, I'd sort of assumed he'd sort him out in some way because he'd heard about. Him. I mean, I don't know for fact, but that was the impression that I got from reading the story. I understand that the captain of the yacht came ashore, spoke to David Lachine, said, "There's a guy that would like to come onto your island and have dinner here," and he said, "Sure." So I got beer. I got beer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and he just didn't know who he was. So there's a couple of things here. First of all, I want to throw myself at the mercy of the court and apologise for an error that I picked up. I, I said that David Glasheen had started a toy company with his brother. Turns out he was actually the chairman of a Sydney-based company which specialised in gold mining in Papua New Guinea. That's quite... Di- what, what kind of toys do you think the Australians play with? Uh, it, it's, it's an example of not just taking the first thing you read as being factual. So apologies to all. I personally think the judge should be very lenient in this matter because you've identified your own error. Uh, also, I thought you were going to say, I, read, I said that he started a toy company, but in fact it was a real company. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, actually, you've just docked yourself a point, haven't you? No! I mean... Your Honour! I don't feel like I should be docked a point if I admit to it. But honestly... Because I wouldn't have known that if you hadn't said... But we have to be upfront with our listeners. We know we sometimes make mistakes, we do our research as best we can, and sometimes errors creep in. 
They do. And to be fair, I said it because I didn't know you hadn't known that. And if you had a done, you would have dogged me How am I going to be known to some Australia that no one's ever heard of? Oh, you know so much random stuff. Yeah, it's always surprising to me what you know. You knew Russell Crowe was New Zealandish. Yeah, that is a good example. Anyway, besides the point, uh, you mentioned earlier about how Dursley would cope being on the island. I did. And we were talking about company and how he might or might not, he'd need some company, but at a distance. Well, how about a dog? Because David Glasheen took a dog with him to the island, a dog called Quasi. So was it a wolf then? A wolf is a quasi dog. Uh Oh, I see. Very good, yeah. yeah. Um, But uh, Quasi was killed two years ago, bitten by a coastal taipan, which is the most venomous snake in the world. Unfortunately, he was very sad about that. But he did make a a new friend, not a domestic dog, but a, a wild dingo called Polly. And they've been best friends since. I thought he'd be... Friends with that crocodile, the bucket head or whatever his name was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to mark you down again because you're saying all of this. I was expecting to be a, him to be a guest. Oh, that would have been amazing. You can't have a crocodile as a guest. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to get hold of uh, David Glasheen. I can imagine. <laughs> it's not the easiest. I put a note in a bottle and threw it into the river. So maybe it'll get to him at some point. Sometime next year. We've had a bottle in from yeah. a David Glasheen. <laughs> but just to let you know, so Polly uh, died in the past week as of as as of we're, we're recording. Polly the Dingo? Polly the Dingo oh, died. Oh no, R.I.P. Polly the Dingo. Bitten by a, uh, a venomous snake. <laughs> Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. It'd been missing for 10 days, and he he went for a walk and found her on the beach, unfortunately, and she had a little bite mark on her leg and foam around her mouth. So here's to you, Polly. Polly. Polly the dingo. Now he has to befriend that bloody crocodile. Or the snakes. Yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? You have to be quite courageous to live on a desert island in Australia. You sure do. You've got to Especially up there when it's in the tropics. Yeah, that is. It's a venomous country, old Australia, isn't it? That's uh, mm. for, for an easy come, easy go place. That everything is a high risk adventure. Every spider and snake that you come across. I, but I, I, yes, I agree. But as you said, it's an enormous country, so the chances of you stumbling on it are relatively slim, unless you go to a desert island on your own. Yeah, true. But while we're talking about creatures of the Australian continent, peculiar creatures, I think Ryan stumbled on the wombat's propensity to poo cubically. So I actually, I I didn't want to give it away in the episode, Ryan, but I was aware of the wombat's uh, square pooed skills from my visit to Australia. Okay. And uh, it's, it's, as you said, the only animal that creates square poos. And relatively recently, I had read that they started to understand the mechanisms of how one might produce these cubic poos the poo comes through as it will do with all of us mm-hmm. uh, but in the the last uh, i think it's a quarter of the digestive tract there's sort of elastic variable elasticity in the intestine mm. and that effectively molds the it the dries out as it dries out as it passes through it reabsorbs the water as the large intestine does uh, and then it squares it into little cubes it pops the cubes out mm-hmm. now why does it pop the cubes out apparently so that you can make Poo towers to attract other wombats. So you were right when you said for building things. I didn't actually know that at the time. I'm right. not going to lie, but uh, <laughs> it turns out I was right when I thought I was making a joke. It's true. But what what evolutionary pressure made them shit bricks, basically? <laughs> Well, I guess the, the sexual selection is one of the great mysteries, isn't it, of evolution, which is... Like, but there are so many things that you could do. How did that happen? That's pretty down the list, isn't it? It, is, you know, it really is. Should, should, should I grow a long, a hairy thing, a, a appendage to show how uh, how proficient I am, or should I build a wall of my shit? I think it's one of the glories of nature that the peacock evolved this beautiful fan display and meanwhile the <laughs> wombat is busy making a tower of his own poo and going sexy <laughs> oh it's it's to attract a mate is it yes okay so they go wow you've got the biggest tower of crap right <laughs> that amazing. is some accomplished brick pooing <laughs> that is well, I mean, it's, a ca- <laughs> it's a case of fecal attraction boom oh hey, he's done it play the tube play the play the sting <laughs> Oh 
Uh, Paul, one of the areas that came up was the topic of Bitcoin, right? So this guy had a load of Bitcoin or had a small amount of Bitcoin, but that became hugely valuable. Uh, we discussed during the episode my personal view that, you know, he didn't really lose out on $100 million or whatever it was in the end because actually there would have been a point way before that where he thought, oh, I'll sell it and go on a nice holiday or something. Absolutely. Um so in the matter of Bitcoin, I'll admit to being something of a Bitcoin sceptic because there are many, many digital currencies and this is just one of them and so it just happens to be the big one. But I don't really claim to understand it. I know there's some sort of blockchain technology behind it, but you know more about technology and stuff like that than, than we do. So is Bitcoin a real goer or is it just a flash in the pan? It's a flash of the pan. It's a bubble. If you if 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 you're lucky enough to get in in, in on the start of it, you you and you manage to cash out, you'll make a lot of money. But most people won't. Have you ever had a bitcoin? Seen a bitcoin? Spent a bitcoin? No, not interested. I I also have never encountered bitcoin and don't really understand how I would even do that. To be honest with you, but then I'm an old man, so maybe that's <laughs> just a statement about how past it I am. Yeah, well. It, the most interesting thing about Bitcoin is these stories you hear and the schadenfreude you feel. Yeah, I did. I did. The story you told, actually, Ron, did remind me. I read a similar one into the guy in the UK who chucked away his hard drive. Oh, was he the Welshman who got people to go through a tip? Well, he, he hadn't actually achieved it. He was applying to the council to say, hey, guys, I think I might have left 50 million quid in your rubbish bin. Uh, and they were not cooperating at all, which I kind of get. And it... it it raises loads of interesting questions about value and money and... You know, Especially digital. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a thing that is of... I mean, it's similar to art, right? You you have a, a painting in your cupboard that you, your grandmother left you and you just don't care about it because it doesn't look very good. And then eventually you put, give it to a charity store and they sell it for £2 and then somebody goes, oh, it's a lost Van Gogh and it goes for £20 million. And Van Gogh, but yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's Van Gogh, actually. <laughs> but it's that sense of, you know, you only knew it was going to be worth $20 million because it found the person who was going to buy it for that because when you got rid of it, it was worth nothing to you. It was, it was just an ugly painting or it was just a hard drive with admittedly some valuable uh, Clive Owen <laughs> short, shorts on. <laughs> Yeah. So I guess it just made me thought about value. Is there such a thing as absolute value, Paul? Well, probably yes, in the sense of a commodity. Like, you know, even now it goes back to gold. You know, there is a finite quantity of something that everybody has agreed that is rare and has a number of uses. Whereas, as, as you say, a, a, a fan hoch painting is an opinion. It's just a piece of canvas with some paint on it whereas something like gold you know is is something fungible isn't it it's something that itself has the value because of the rarity and you know one piece of gold is the same as any other piece of gold there's nothing to define them but that only lasts as long as we all agree that gold is valuable right as soon as there is a massive apocalypse and you can't eat gold sandwiches are going to be more valuable than gold or an asteroid is brought to Earth that's got full of gold and suddenly we're yeah, swamped in the Yeah, a big gold asteroid, then everyone's got loads of gold. Suddenly we're like, yeah, whatever. Oh, yes, um, but that that's sort of very unlikely to happen. Also, one might suggest that a gold asteroid hitting the Earth will still kill all life. <laughs> but, that, but the three who are remaining, loads of gold. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I imagine there are lots of things that are as rare as gold, yet we... Yeah, lots of things that are rarer. Yeah, and that are rarer, but we don't put a value on them because we either don't like them, they don't have that same agreed value. Yeah, socially. a lot of it must be history, right? I, I suppose gold, as, as Pete said, has a history of... It's not so rare as nobody has it, but it's rare enough to be a luxury. I guess if someone discovered an, a mineral that was identically available as gold... Then it'd be gold. But without the history <laughs> of it being valuable, somebody's going, there's only X amount of this, and that happens to be the exact same amount of gold there is, probably wouldn't do it. Wouldn't turn it into a gold equivalent, would it, overnight? You still need everyone to agree, this is our fungible, exchangeable well, it's, it's metal. Got, yeah, it's it's got to have... It would have to have a, some sort of use, either as a, decor a decorative use, you, you know, some some sort of... 
where it has some sort of modulus, like a bulk modulus or Young's modulus, where gold is actually very ductile. It's the most ductile element. So, so it's useful. It has use to it. it ha- oh, yes. It ha- gold has a lot of uses. Mm. Sorry, just for the listeners and definitely not for me and Ryan, by ductile, what do we mean exactly? Ductile means it can be drawn into a wire, but you can sort of bash it and expand it out. And I, th- I think there's a museum in Japan or Korea where there's like an ounce of gold that's shown as an ounce of gold. And then above it is another ounce that's been sort of flattened into a leaf. Uh, and, you know, it's it's 10 foot by 10 foot square. <laughs> right, because you can flatten it down that small. Malleable, I think, is Malleable. the word, as opposed to ductile. So for me, the big practical argument against Bitcoin is the fluctuations that you see in the value of it, right? So gold has historically been a a thing that has held value and that Bitcoin goes up and down in such dramatic ways suggests it's not a stable currency. And that's one of the characteristics of the international currencies that people use is a degree of stability. And the fact that it's wanging up and down I'd agree in with substantial that. ways means it hasn't got that universal confidence. That but it's really been want. going for 10 years, right? That's You'd expect it to still be fluctuating and right. to stabilize which, over time. Which tells me that that's, it's not yet. Let's cut to the, the chase. You know, let's say in the next month that there are loads of standoffs between China and America and Britain and Russia. Which, which will go up, gold or Bitcoin? Uh, I, I mean, honestly, I don't know. Oh, Bitcoin wouldn't. I, I, I don't after know. The world's dis- after the world's destroyed or half destroyed, Bitcoins are, Bitcoins are going to be useless. At least gold, in some sense, has a value because it'll still exist. Probably. I think another thing that makes me nervous about Bitcoin is simply that it's just one of many of digital currencies, right? So Yeah, yeah any, anybody can create one. It's just so- solving elliptic equations. In, I, but I also can imagine a situation in 30 years' time where there's now 40 years of Bitcoin, it's all stabilised and everyone's actually agreed, everyone's agreed there is some intrinsic value to it. Mm. As long as, and that's the, that's the confidence question, as long as everyone agrees something has value, it does. And so if Bitcoin became so ubiquitous, it would become a currency, I think. Well, maybe you're right, because... Bitcoin has existed for 15 years. You know, gold has existed s- since the dawn of man. Yeah. And so it has had time to get to this level as a source of confidence, whatever you want to call it. I think it. if I can draw this to a close, I would summarise it by saying I once really aspired to owning a Laserdisc player and that's why I don't trust Bitcoin. It's a superior method for for doing the watching of movies. However, I it's the Betamax. That's it. That's that's the thing. Um, Bitcoin is the Betamax of currencies. Right. Well, I think it's time, guys, to get to Let's the main event, oh, which yeah. is the analysis, the assessment, the judgment. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Paul Dursley, your honour, can I ask you to first describe to us how you felt the informational content, the knowledge that you gained from this episode rates in your uh, estimation? I, th- I think you had an easy country and an easy time period and... A relatively easy, if abstruse, category. However, I think you did quite well. Ooh. Thank you, Your Honour. Nice. And what's that in letters? I will give that a B minus. Nice. That's good. That's good. That's good. Okay, so we've tossed that shrimp on the barbie. Ah. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> crack open a tinny with the <laughs> entertainment factor how much did you enjoy what you learned where <laughs> uh, you know this this was australia where were where were the skits you know the uh, the cod australian accents i was i was expecting a, a, a couple of funny skits i saw pete where scribbling the... down pen while we were recording and i expected him to come up with some crazy bruce's uh, bruce's on the beach oh so it's not your fault it's pete's fault it's Pete's fault. It's not your yeah. fault. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote uh, Sabotage Ryan, no sketches this week. <laughs> I'm afraid it's a D+. Plus. D+, plus. ouchie. That's ouchie. painful. Well, uh, there's always the recovery of the Dursal factor. Dursal factor being 
Just how did you feel? It related personally to the material, the country, the time period? Just uh, what Ryan presented? How did it resonate with Ryan you? Ryan was very bold in going through the nuclear argument <laughs> at the start. <laughs> it was brave. And there were more than one take. <laughs> and there were, there, were, there were lots of pauses, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I left those in the edit as well. <laughs> you, you missed, of course, that Australia has a big, hi- a big history for nuclear testing. Uh, do you know what? That's a really good point. I didn't even look that up. So there was the Operation Hurricane off the Montebello Islands, which was Britain's first atomic bomb, where we blew up HMS Plym uh, and it. left quite a bit and left quite a bit of radioactive. Then there was Emu Field and Maralinga, which were two other test, two other nuclear testing sites in South Australia. Huh. So as you miss that, see. Oh dear. He's the judge, he's the judge, judge in all of the things we does. He's the judge, 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 his name's Paul Dursley. All rise for the judge. What's it to be, Paul? I think, I think it'll have a plus at the end of it, but I think the leading character is a C, I'm afraid. C plus? That's like a passing grade. That's a passing grade. I see that as a B. (laughs) Even if it's not. (laughs) Thank you, Your Honour. I'll take your C plus gladly and willingly. Oh, you're not going to storm off this time? No, no storming off this time. I think C plus is absolutely fine. Well, you know, Um, it's easy come, easy go, isn't it, It's easy come, easy go. (laughs) Exactly. He's the judge, he's the judge, judge in all of the things we does. He's the judge, 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 judge. His name's Paul Dursley. That is our show for this week. Thank you for listening. If you want to get in touch about any of the things we've talked about on this show, just say hello to us or just get in touch. We like to talk to people. Reach out on social media through the website, hhepodcast.com, or you can email Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. You never know. You could be the main event on a future show. <laughs> the main event? Well, uh, an event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, an afterthought. <laughs> yeah, can you just say that again? <laughs> You could be an afterthought on a future show. <laughs> Feels, I, was, I felt like that didn't seem like enough. <laughs> does it doesn't seem like an attractive hit, does it? it does Oh, well. Look, one way to definitely be a low-rent part of our episode, <laughs> just an afterthought, <laughs> is, to rate, is to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Uh, it, it's your recommendation we're after because it helps bring new people to the show and we love new people coming along because they love the show. And you love the show and we love the show. Everyone loves the show. Look, if you're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, you can find us. Our handle is at HHE Podcast. Uh, If you subscribe, you'll get an alert when we do our little one-minute videos, which are a lot of fun. Mm, They are. Um, We're going to be back again very soon with our next episode, which is... Do you want me to remind you? No, I remember. (laughs) Very clearly. It's the early bird in Jordan during the... Paleogene? The Paleogene, yes. A mere 42 million years ago. (laughs) Sorry. Was that? Did you just explode? Yes, I, I, I'm just I'm remembering okay. what it is. So I'll, <laughs> no time machines. No time machines. <laughs> <laughs> You've been warned. All right. Okay. In the meantime, though, if you can't wait for Pete's amazing episode, <laughs> check out our back catalogue of episodes, which you can find in your podcast app on YouTube or on our website, which is hhepodcast.com. All right. So massive thank you to Ryan for an excellent episode. Thank you, Pete. Uh, thank you to the judge for his hard efforts. Thanks, judge. And hard judging, let's be honest. Thank you. Uh, and that's it. So I guess all that's left to say is... You've been listening to... History happened everywhere. The verdict... We're going to play a game, guys. It's called Slang or Dang. So we're going to run through some Australian slang words. Yes. And you're going to tell me, are they real slang or are they dang? As in, I made them up. Okay, let's start with easy. Tucker, is that slang or is that dang? Well, tucker is bush bush tucker, which means food. I concur. Okay, very good. Very good. Yes, that you're both correct. It is indeed slang. All right, next one. Is this slang or is this dang? The word... Dursle. <laughs> is that slang or is that dang? Of course you've just made that up. Oh, that sounds dang to me. <laughs> it is dang. All right, Paul, chuck. Is that slang or dang? Well, a chuck is a chicken, isn't it? That's right. It's slang. Pete, Aussie salute. 
Is that slang or dang? I think that is slang. And do you know what it is? Two fingers up. No. An actual salute. No. <laughs> uh, I can pass it. I'm passing it over to Paul. Pass it. Oz's salute would probably be the V sign. No, that's what Pete thought it was. No, it's waving away flies. Oh. So waving flies away from your face. That is an Aussie salute. So it's slang. Frothy fork. Is that slang or dang? I'm going dang. Yeah, I agree with Pete. Dang is the right answer. Pincers. Slang or dang? Now, either it means tight underwear or you've made it up. So is it slang or is it dang? <laughs> I, th- I think you've made it up. So what's the word? I'm not going to say it. <laughs> you've got to say the word. What do you want me to do? Yeah. Well, I, I think that's dang. <laughs> <laughs> you can just patch that in. Just edit that in. It is indeed dang. <laughs> Pincers is not a word. I made that up. Bludger. Is that slang or dang? I would have said it It was a made up You think it's a dang? Pete, what do you think? I think it's slang. It is slang. Someone who scrounges off you. Oh. Someone who's lazy. A bludger. Goppy. Is that slang or dang? Made up. I'm going to dang that. That is definite dang. <laughs> okay, last one. Last one of slang and dang. Shark biscuit. It's got to be slang for a swimmer or Surf something, isn't it? Oh, a surfboard would be yes, good, wouldn't it? Yeah, a surfboard, yeah. yeah. It is slang. It's slang for kids at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that oh, is funny. Oh, look at all these shark biscuits <laughs> running around. Nice.